Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Rogers, President and CEO of the Texas Heart Institute. And we're in the studio this afternoon with Dr. Gary Rubin, who is the 2024 uh, recipient of the THI Fish Award. Uh, he's just given a terrific grand rounds on the, an update on carotid artery stenting. And I'm joined in the studio today uh, by my colleague, Dr. Zvanko Krazier, one of the interventional cardiologists who has a rich history of clinical care and uh, research in uh, interventional procedures. We usually use this time just to uh, expand on some of the things we learned in Grand Rounds, and it gives us a chance to ask some questions that we didn't uh, discuss in the context of our Grand Rounds presentation. So Dr. Rubin, again, thank you very much for a wonderful Grand Rounds, but for joining us here in the studio uh, after, after your talk today. My pleasure. Thank you. If it's okay, I'd like to just start. I, I was really struck uh, in one of your slides, you showed uh, the improvements over time in an important clinical outcome in carotid artery stenting trials, which was a combined endpoint of mortality and stroke, which seems like a pretty obvious uh, clinical endpoint for clinical trials. But, the, but you're getting so good. Uh, you're now getting uh, long-term results where the incidence of that combined endpoint is under 1%. And I'm interested to understand what you're thinking about as a clinical trialist. How are we going to continue to advance this field if we've gotten so good at that endpoint? Are we only going to be doing non-inferiority studies going forward? Or how will we be proving superiority for the next iteration of a carotid artery intervention? We will have in 2026 the results of the CREST-2 trial. The CREST-2 trial will tell us the, about the status of our patients in terms of stroke pre prevention with optimal five-star medical therapy, which not all our patients can tolerate, but that's the goal. That's the, that's the banner we're looking for. What we'll be able to do then is um, judge how good our interventional revascularization techniques are against that, that new standard benchmark. Now, uh, we, uh, as you must do with clinical trials, if you're trying to test the value of a procedure, you must um, give the procedure a chance by having operators who represent a good section of the community at large, but who can are effective at, at using the procedure safely. Now we have over 250 carotid stent operators throughout the country, North America, Canada, some in, some in uh, the Middle East, in Israel, some in Australia. Now, um, these operators represent really this, these uh, great outcomes. So our challenge then is to say to the average uh, interventionalist, who could be an uh, interventional neurologist, interventional cardiologist, interventional radiologist, interventional neurosurgeon or vascular surgeon, look, this is the standard of care now. We have to teach them exactly what we did, how we did it, what adjunctive medical therapy we used. The important thing about the credentialing and the uh, performance of CREST-2 was that we know exactly whatever results we get, how we got them, with what sort of training the operators had, because we've kept that data very, very carefully, what sort of techniques we used, etc. So we'll be able to take that information and use it to educate the physician group at large that wants to practice carotid stenting. And I think uh, that'll be the next important step once we have the outcomes from CREST-2. If I may add, as a matter of fact, uh, for CREST-2 trial, and similarly so for CREST, it's not that uh, the cardiologist or interventionalist in general from all the specialists were asked to show their results and their ability how to perform carotid artery stenting, but also the surgeons that were performing enterectomy were also held to that standard of care where they had to perform at the top quality what is expected from them, which is important. So it's not biased one way or the other. Do you agree with that? Was it no, that's absolutely correct. But let's remember that uh, these two 
separate parallel trials represent different populations of patients, we will not be able to legitimately compare the outcomes in the stenting arm. We're comparing stenting plus optimal medical therapy with medical therapy alone. Then we have a separate population of patients in the endarterectomy arm. They're, they may be older, they may be younger, we don't know. But they're going to be different patients and um, we won't be making a comparison, but yes, you are correct. That's the surgeons that were in Crest 2 needed to be, for all the obvious reasons we've talked about, they had to be really good surgeons to be in. And so they, they uh, did the same thing with their credential. I wanted to ask you one very pertinent question related to carotid artery stenting. So we are now close to, we are three decades from the original procedures that you have performed and I shortly after that and a year after your first experience came to UAB which you were there in charge of carotid artery stenting and cardiology in general and I learned quite a bit from you. Tremendous progress has been made in technology and technique and selection of patients for carotid artery stenting. Maybe you should comment, uh, so what progress have been made, what technology and techniques have improved, and also are, do we still have some unmet needs? And maybe looking at a specific subgroup of patients that we still have uh, challenges with. In my scenario, this is uh, post endarterectomy restenosis and post-radiation uh, stenosis, uh, and how do you look at it? That's a pretty wide question. <laughs> Oh, good, good question, and yes, there are always unmet needs. We have improved the outcomes from carotid stenting tremendously, as you saw from that graph, from 5 6% complication rates to under a half of 1% through very careful patient selection. And let me emphasize that. Carotid stenting, in fact, any procedure, it depends on the cognitive ability of the operator to understand who uh, is eligible for this really fantastic procedure. And, and I will uh, mention specifically that elderly patients, vasculopathic patients, patients with a lot of tortuosity or angulation in their vessels and lesions, and patients with heavy calcification. Now, this doesn't represent a huge percentage of the patients that we treat. They're an important percentage because they're the patients who have higher risk from stenting and probably need to be considered for alternative therapies. It could be medical therapy, it could be endarterectomy, it could be transcarotid, TICA, a good technique for patients who have a bad aortic arch. So that's important. And by learning about the patients who do well and those who don't, by rigorous follow-up of our patients, uh, over the decades you mentioned, we now understand that. We also understand there are certain technical elements of a procedure which your, uh, the operators here at Texas Heart, know all too well and are very familiar with. And we've discussed many of them today, but uh, that has to be done correctly. Again, any surgical technique, bypass surgery, um, endarectomy, it, there's this technical skill must be learned, must be acquired. It's not difficult to learn these techniques, but then it has to be applied. So specifically, we have this group of patients who have had prior neck radiation or prior endarterectomy, and for one reason or another, we see this in other vascular beds. We see it sort of in the coronaries. We still see it occasionally in the coronaries. Um, we see it in the great vessels. We see it in the lower extremity vessels that they tend to proliferate and re the nose. And it's, it, it's uh, uh, advanced in patients, particularly with uh, radiation injury to their necks. They represent patients that cannot be safely operated on for the most part. So stenting is a great option. However, the stents tend to re the nose in this group um, Far in far greater numbers than we would normally see, which normally restenosis is a very rare event for a standard carotid stent procedure. We know less than 
In this group, it can be as high as 30%. But what we've learned, and, I, and I'm delighted to say, collaborative research with you and others here at Texas Heart, that we can use drug-eluting peripheral stents, and we've had some extraordinary anecdotal outcomes. And now we're putting a series together to see if we can um, help uh, inform uh, the rest of the community about this option, because these patients are not surgical, they don't have surgical options, they don't have medical options, and this looks like it's going to be a very effective technique. So a drug-eluting um, paclitaxel peripheral stent or a drug-eluting rapamycin analog peripheral stent. Dr. Rubin, I have one burning desire to ask you a question related to uh, your early experience when you were at Emory working with Andreas Grunzing, who is a father of coronary and, for all practical purposes, peripheral angioplasty. And you worked with him in the early 80s and uh, performed coronary angioplasty procedures with so-called Grunzing balloon. What were the unmet needs that you uh, pursued to resolve the problems that you saw occurring with balloon angioplasty in these early stages? It's an interesting question. It really points to why we do things with uh, innovation and, and science to improve patient care. The problem with the balloon technique, which was brilliant, and for which Grunziger, had he not died um, prematurely in a plane accident, would have, I'm sure, many believe, received the Nobel Prize in medicine for his work. But the sh he knew it. But the shortcoming of balloon angioplasty was that the lesion would recoil and dissect, and these vessels would close in maybe 5 or 10% of patients. 90% were okay, but the 10% where it happened was a big problem. It's called abrupt closure. And the, by the early 80s, tens of thousands of patients were receiving, avoiding traumatic bypass by getting the Grunzig balloon procedure. I was working with Andreas at that time, and he was looking at lasers and hot balloons and cold balloons and aphrectomy and all sorts of ways to improve the balloon results so we didn't get that abrupt closure. Um, he called me to his office one day and he introduced me to Cesar Gianturco. Gianturco was a radiologist, retired, who had produced uh, the first self-expanding stent and he used it and he developed it here in Houston at MD Anderson Hospital and he used it in the vena cava to push encroaching uh, tumors away from the vena cava. And uh, Cesar Gianturco came in and, and, and showed me this little self-expanding spring. It was like a little Z. He had pushed into a catheter and he said, uh, um, what do you think? And Andrea said, look, um, this is Dr. Gianturco's stents. People are talking about stents. Um, and so why don't you take this to the laser animal lab and see what happens? Well, it was a total failure. You had pushed it out, it could end up anywhere. We couldn't place it accurately. Um, and then where we, even when we got it inside some of these animals, unfortunately, they didn't survive. And then um, some months later, Andreas tragically leaves us. But the problem and his legacy lived on. And my mission uh, in his memory was to solve this problem of abrupt closure because I realized his method, his technique, and the opportunity to use the balloon angioplasty in multi-vessel disease and taking care of many millions of patients would depend on a reliable way to keep these blood vessels open. Um, during this grieving period, about three or four months after Grunzig died, Jim Turco comes back. He said, I've heard yet you don't like the little self-expanding Z. I said, Caesar, this will not work in the coronaries. And self-expanding stents have never worked in the coronaries, as a matter of fact. And so he said, when I was at MD Anderson, I had this little thing I did on one of Grunzig's balloons. I wound the wires around, we crimped it, and we expanded it. And here's a picture of it in a, in a dog uh, iliac artery. 
he said, what do you think? And I said, yeah, this could work. We could position it accurately. We won't lose it off the balloon. We can expand it to different diameters. It's still using Grunzig's balloon. So we started this long journey, which was to figure out the right balloons, the right wire, the right crimp. Uh, it was uh, sounds simple now, but we did figure it out. And then that resulted two years later in the first balloon expandable stent in any patient in the world. They had put some self-expanding stents in Europe. And we did that in September of 1987, abrupt closure, immediate solution, obvious resolution of chest pain, EKG changes, it changed the world. And um, I'm very proud of that moment. And uh, it was the beginning of something great in interventional cardiology. Thank you for asking. Well, thank great. you for this historical information, <laughs> which is really invaluable. Yeah, Dr. Rubin, it's just it's it's uh, it's inspiring to have someone who has had such a profound impact on cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disease uh, here at the Texas Heart Institute over the last couple of days. Uh, congratulations again uh, on being the recipient of this year's Fish Award. We appreciate it, and we look forward to hosting you back sometime in the future so you can continue to educate us. Thanks very much. Thank you.